welcome to You Are Not A Frog, life hacks for doctors and busy professionals who want to beat burnout and work happier. I'm Dr. Rachel Morris. I'm a GP, turned coach, speaker and specialist in teaching resilience. And I'm interested in how we can wake up and be excited about going to work no matter what. I've had 20 years experience of working in the NHS, both on the front line and teaching leadership and resilience. I know what it's like to feel overwhelmed, worried about making a mistake and one crisis away from not coping. 2021 promises to be a particularly challenging year. Even before the coronavirus crisis, we were facing unprecedented levels of burnout. We have been compared to frogs in a pan of slowly boiling water, working harder and longer. And the heat has been turned up so slowly that we hardly notice the extra long days becoming the norm and have got used to the low grade feelings of stress and exhaustion. Let's face it, frogs generally only have two choices stay in the pan and be boiled alive or jump out of the pan and leave but you are not a frog and that's where this podcast comes in you have many more options than you think you do it is possible to be master of your own destiny and to craft your work and life so that you can thrive even in the most difficult of circumstances Through training as an executive and team coach, I discovered some hugely helpful resilience and productivity tools that transformed the way I approached my work. I've been teaching these principles over the last few years as the Shapes Toolkit programme, because if you're happier at work, you'll simply do a better job. In this podcast, I'll be inviting you inside the minds of friends, colleagues and experts, all who have an interesting take on this so that together we can take back control to thrive, not just survive, in our work and our lives and love what we do again. Hello and welcome to another episode of the podcast and uh, this is another joint podcast with myself and Dr Caroline Walker all about how we can um, support our colleagues on the front line during the Covid crisis. So Caroline do you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah, hi Rachel, thanks for having me back on the podcast. Um, I'm Dr Caroline Walker and I'm a a psychiatrist and therapist by background and I specialise in the wellbeing of doctors and I founded uh, The Joyful Doctor. It's lovely to be here with you, thanks for having me. And I'm Dr Rachel Morris, I'm a GP turned executive and team coach and I'm host of the You Are Not A Frog podcast. I also specialise in resilience in the workplace so I've created the Shapes Toolkit which is a training programme for doctors and other professionals in high stress jobs. Happy New Year and what a new year it is. Yes, I've been saying Happy New Year to patients all week and just thinking oh such that it is, you know, it's so strange isn't it this year. Really, really strange and we we were chatting earlier this week weren't we and we thought we'd um reflect on the fact that actually it's not like anything we've ever experienced before and we thought probably time to jump on and do another podcast in our sort of supporting frontline workers through the covid crisis series so mm-hmm. you know 2021 i was quite i was quite looking forward to 2021 thinking wow we're going to get back to normal things are going to be much better but i'm i'm starting to doubt that now I mean, what do you think is going to be happening well, I think, yeah, like you, I think a lot, there was a lot of talk around, wasn't there, about, you know, goodbye, good riddance, 2020, it's been terrible, and now we've got the vaccine coming, 2021, there's all this hope, and it's all going to be so much better, and and actually, I think that's not really realistic, I think it's going to be pretty tough for, for a while, certainly for a few months, um, if not longer, so, and I think a lot of people are feeling that right now, you know, there was that initial kind of hope that it was all going to feel a bit better, and and now this sort of slight anticlimax. And we always get a bit of an anticlimax in January, don't we? You know, there's always those sort of, oh, new year, new beginnings feeling. And then, oh, like two weeks in, we're sort of tired and fed up and given up on all our New Year's resolutions. Uh, but this year is just extraordinarily, yeah, it's like that, but on steroids, you know, with everything that's happening with the COVID second wave and the lockdown and here in the UK, you know, it's a tough, tough time for a lot of people out there at the moment. See, I think this lockdown feels very different from the, the, the previous two lockdowns. And I've been puzzling about why it is, because actually, if anything, this lockdown should be a bit more hopeful than the previous ones, because we know that there is a vaccine coming out which works, which is just, it's phenomenal. Because when we first locked down, we didn't even know if they would have a vaccine within the next five years. Now we've got mm-hmm. two, three, four, five, six that, that are working. So, so we should feel more help, hopeful, but me and a lot of people I've spoken to 
we're finding this one a lot harder. Why, yeah. why do you think that is? I think what we're experiencing at the moment, what a lot of people are experiencing is what I would call an acute stress response. So it's what we experience as humans when something really big comes along that's quite scary or threatening or difficult. Um, and when we have an acute stress response, we tend, tend to feel a bit, a bit stressed. Uh, we get lots of thoughts about it, tend to be thinking about it a lot. We're a bit more, um, a bit more kind of wired and um, on edge as if we're worried something bad's happening or going to happen, and often cases it is. Um, we're perhaps not sleeping as well. We might be reaching for that wine or that chocolate a bit more um, than usual. And I think we're getting that same acute stress response as we did the first time round. But this time, it's not so unexpected. Uh, and actually, it's coming on the back of nearly a year's worth of change and drama and challenge and we're tired you know we're exhausted and it's also you know last time around there was a bit of excitement because it was kind of new and different and there was a sort of energy of oh you know we can get through this it'll be over in a few months it'll be okay whereas now there's a more kind of realistic hmm this is actually going to be around for a long time and it's going to have knock on impact for a long time so there's kind of not that high energy to in a good way to go with the high energy of the stress as well there's like the stress but with the tiredness and the demotivation and the oh feeling it's really tough it's really tough and I've been feeling it too definitely mm. so in the first time there was a lot of adrenaline going around but there was also a bit of excitement and we're all in this together yeah. this time there's the adrenaline but there's not any of the excitement and actually what I've noticed you know it doesn't feel so much for people like we are all in this together the NHS has got uh, so much for bashing recently and it's just you know it's gone from the clapping to the not clapping and now they're sort of clapping again but the NHS as the people are saying actually we'd rather you didn't clap we'd rather you just had the vaccine and gave us a break please <laughs> yeah yeah it's really difficult isn't it because I think I think on one level we are still kind of all in it together but we're also being pulled in lots of different directions now and we can all when something big comes along we can all kind of rally together for a short while um but actually after a while we start to kind of look at different priorities and so and what what it feels like a bit to me at the moment talking to a lot of doctors is there's this slight expectation that things are going to try and get back to normal at the same time as dealing with this you know second wave which is even worse than the first one and that's just completely unrealistic mm. you know I think we are in extraordinary circumstances at the moment and we need to adapt what we're doing to cope with that. And I think what's happening with a lot of people and I was talking about this on a webinar I was doing with my sort of leaders community yesterday was that we are responding to the new challenges. So the vaccinating everybody, keeping everybody safe, looking after everyone, responding like we would do at the beginning of a crisis, mm. putting all in and just being on all the time and working as hard as we can, yeah. as if this was just gonna be lasting a week <laughs> yeah. or two weeks. But actually this is not gonna last a week or two weeks. We're in it for the long haul and it's going to be several months of, yeah of getting all the vaccinations out, of looking after patients, of dealing with clients who are having financial difficulties, or whatever you're doing. Mm. So, you, so actually going at it all guns and burning yourself out in the first week, it, it, you can't do that. It's not an option. Because... Well, and of course, this isn't really week one. Some, a lot of people have been going since oh, October, yeah. November, yeah. through December, you know, and so actually already people are exhausted and at the edge of burnout um, and still, as you say, looking forward to potentially months of this to come. So, mm. yeah, it's really tough. And I think it's really important that we think about pacing ourselves. And I've had to do this myself this week and it's been really hard because there's a part of me, the doctor in me, that wants to get out there and help as many people as I possibly can right now, right? Today, tomorrow, the next day, every day from now on. But I know if I do that, I'm going to burn out. Mm. And actually that's not going to help anybody. So there's this awful, like, you have to make these choices. You know, you have to kind of say to yourself, no, I'm going to have the night off or I'm going to have the weekend off or I'm going to take annual leave. And that's really hard to do when you know that your colleagues are out there struggling and fighting to help people. You want to be there with them by their side. But we have to look after ourselves. We have to, because this is a, going to be a long-term thing that's going on for quite a while. Yeah, 100%. So we, we wanted to just to share some strategies and a few mm -hmm. tips and techniques about about what to do right now. And, you know, I guess a lot of this stuff will be repeating because you're just saying over and over again, but you can't, I don't think you can emphasize enough how we need to just get back to the basics. So I think one of the things I've realized about well-being is 
that I keep having to revisit it for myself. It's not like you, you learn it and one day you implement it and that that's you done for the rest of your yeah. life. It's like yeah. every week, every month, okay, where have I slipped down? What do I need to remind yeah. myself of? Yeah. And, and I think- Water is a biggie for me. I'm always forgetting to drink enough water and it's almost like every day I have to remind myself, you know, keep drinking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess what this is what we wanted to do in this session, just give a bit of a reminder and just some encouragement about about what to do and, and give you permission give you permission to look after yourselves in the way that you would look at, want to look after your patients and your customers and your families and, and and everything you know it's so important that you give yourself the space and time to do that so so caroline if you were to sort of outline some really key things to do at the moment you know without wanting to overburden people with yet another thing they've got to think about what would what would be in your list super simple super basic stuff um like your basic routine you know thinking about eating sleeping resting really bring it back to those basics because it's so easy for those to slip and at the moment you know i spoke to maybe 20 30 doctors this week and many of them are kind of missing meals or um not going to sleep at the same time as they would normally or um just not doing those basic things maybe they're not having a shower as often or you know they're not switching off as uh, at all if, if you know maybe a little bit not certainly not as much as they would normally so i go back to the basics basics look at your daily routine are you eating and drinking enough you know those very very simple things because if those are out of luck it's really hard to kind of let them focus on the other things that are going to help you beyond that I think rest is so important. And I, I've been thinking a lot about rest recently. You know, I've, been, I've got a podcast coming up with um, a, a, a GP who was a GB triathlete and she suffered with over overtraining syndrome. And she's, re- I mean, as an athlete, you do know that your rest days are as important as your training days. Yeah. We don't realize that for ourselves, but thinking about, you know, most of us at the moment are operating from our sort of threat zone, high adrenaline or our drive zone. I've got to accomplish this, um, which is sort of driven by dopamine and sort of cortisol. But what we're not operating very much out of is our rest and digest zone where our parasympathetic (laughs) system with the oxytocin and serotonin where it takes over, which we we really need to be in but actually I think I think even actually before the coronavirus pandemic doctors and other professionals in high stress jobs were really rubbish at this rest thing because even in our leisure time we would pursue leisure like I've got to run a marathon so that's that's not really rest that's sort of drive (laughs) yeah and you don't have to go crazy with it you don't have to do a lot of it to make a big difference you know start with something really really simple like a couple of like 10 seconds of you know deep breathing is going to help um so and often i find with doctors anchoring it to something that you do in your day-to-day life like washing your hands or putting on your ppe or doing something that you're doing regularly that you do automatically without thinking but if you can anchor in some parasympathetic time into that um activity so you might do mindful hand washing or your as you're putting on your ppe you take some deep breaths and then that's going to make a big difference because it will just bring your body down out of that threat mode several times throughout the day, just for a few seconds at a time. You can start with something like that and then build on it. You don't need to be meditating for an hour and a half on top of a mountain top. You know, it make it something that's achievable and that you can do in your everyday life. Yeah, I, I think that's really good advice. Even just even just ten minutes of maybe a meditation app like headspace which is yeah headspace or calm yeah calm headspace because i know people feel that they're too busy even for that Mm -hmm. but actually how much time you spend scrolling through your phone and on social media and whatsapp and stuff like that you know actually you do have that 10 minutes it's just you're using it in different ways and and scrolling through the problem with sort of just scrolling mindlessly through your phone it's not really mindless you're bombarded by all this this stuff that then you know certainly if I look at some of the Facebook groups I'm in at the moment that's mm-hmm. certainly putting up my threats yeah um my threat hormones is it where the adrenaline I'm thinking oh you know yeah. so it's one of the first things I did actually in the first lockdown I've done it again recently is limit my exposure to the news and limit my exposure to social media yeah, yeah. um so I don't ignore it completely I'm still there and I tap in but I, I set boundaries around it and I think it is all about boundaries and it's about putting ourselves first so yes you might miss that that news item or that thing on Facebook but you know what we are going to hear all the important stuff you can't not I had a few days where I didn't listen to any news and I still somehow through like just 
talking to people around me got the main bits of information that I needed to get you know we will know what we need to know I think there's that fear of missing out isn't there that kind of drives us to want to just keep on top of everything but if you can try to put a bit of boundaries around that so maybe just a certain amount of time a day half an hour a day 10 minutes a day whatever works for you but try and boundary that a little otherwise you're down the rabbit hole and before you know it you spent three hours looking at you know Instagram and Facebook and we've all done it and it's easier done right yeah I was reading a, a book recently that's, that's had was phenomenal actually it's called make time if anyone wants to look at it um, and they suggest that um, they now just look at some news once a week because they say right. if anything yeah. really important happens they'll yeah. tell they'll know about it and also yeah. rather than just watching news on telly which is just a series of talking heads and repeated over and over yeah. they read a news magazine like the economist or the week or yeah, something or the week. yeah like summary. gives them a, a really good yeah. commentary on stuff I, I can see how that would be yeah. much more helpful than spending hours definitely yeah and if you can doing it on a non-screen like in an actual paper form it's really good for your eyes and that that virtual fatigue that we're all getting as well being on screens so much yeah so just thinking about that so we're not just doing it on you know autopilot without thinking yeah I think um you've just reminded me as well this thing about taking breaks I think particularly um for for healthcare workers who are sort of delivering outpatient type services and I know that um, particularly for GPs they've gone from being able to get up call patients into the room bring the patients in talk to them with a coffee break hopefully scheduled in and a lunch break to suddenly just having lists of telephone triage or video triage which aren't time bound so there's no breaks structured in so I've been saying to people you've got to actually structure put some breaks in and plan what you're going to do in them otherwise you will just sit yeah. In front of your computer from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m., you may not even get up, get up for three yeah. hours. And um, breaks aren't a luxury. We don't do them just for fun. They are absolutely essential to our proper brain functioning, right? It switches out of that focused brain mode into that more diffuse brain mode. And we talk about this, Rachel, on your podcast. Um, and they recharge us and they make us more efficient. That's the point. So, you know, if we have breaks, we're going to get more done. We often think, oh, I don't have time for a break. You don't have time not to have a break. That's the point. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, building that in. And if you possibly can get in some sunlight, you know, it's really difficult this time of year. But even just for one minute, walking outside, standing on the doorstep of your building for one minute or standing at a window, looking at natural daylight for one minute is going to help. So, yeah. Again, it's the thing that all basic things, you know, the thing that makes me take a break is knowing that when I'm on a break, your, your brain is connecting across the hemispheres you actually start to solve problems so I yeah. think to myself I'm really stuck break yeah. I'll come back oh I've got the I've yeah. got the answer to that how did that happen it's yeah like, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, similarly asleep you know overnight like if you're worrying about something at five o'clock leave it on your desk leave yourself a little note for the next day try don't think about it put it on the back burner as they say and come back to it and it you know sometimes Works. the problem's gone away or you've come up with a solution yeah 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 so I know there's an awful lot else we want to talk about but just boundaries mm-hmm. I'd just like to ask you Karen, yeah. because I know a lot of people are so busy trying to sort of sort things out deliver this for their their patients you know run a vaccination program that they feel that they need to be on their emails almost 24 hours a day or, or all evening what would what would you say to people when genuinely they have got a lot to organize and they've yeah. got a really important role and they need to be contactable. How do you set boundaries yeah. in that sort of situation? It's hard. You know, we, I find this very, very hard. I've just had to do it for myself recently again, because I was starting to check my emails a bit more evenings and weekends. Um, I think it's easier to try and to put in a strong boundary rather than to try and wean it back. So like to say to yourself, okay, I'm only going to check up between these hours or uh, for example, a lot of people at the moment taking their emails off their phone. Yes. That's really helping mm. because then you're not, it's not, you just don't have the access. So you think, oh, I'll just do it on my computer. I'll just do it when I'm working by my computer. So making, putting in these kind of things that hold that boundary for you. So you don't have to keep making that choice is, is much more um, easy to stick with. Um, I think I find it quite helpful to think what would happen if I got run over by a bus tomorrow because if I get run over by a bus tomorrow and I'm in ITU for six weeks or I'm dead those emails you know it's not going to matter they don't actually have to be answered today they don't very very few things apart from CPR can wait everything else can wait right 
Um, so I think we have to get really honest with ourselves about that because I think our egos take over a little bit and we think, oh, I'm the most important person in the world. And if I don't answer this now, then it won't get done. Or, or, or. But actually, it will be okay. The world isn't going to, the sky isn't going to fall down if you don't answer that email today. So set yourself some sort of boundary about when you're going to answer emails and where on what devices and try and stick to it. That's going to be easier than to, going into email and go, I'll just check a few of them. Um, because once you're in you're in and you'll be like down the rabbit hole again <laughs> yeah and I've just taken my email off my phone it's made again. an extraordinary amount of difference to my stress level actually again. because the evidence and again it's from the, the book I just read called make time they say that people who check their emails just three times a day yeah. are much less stressed but just as efficient as yeah. people who check it 10 20 times because often I guess when you're checking your email on your phone you often don't reply but you're getting the stress of, of knowing that there's that task to do. Whereas you're yeah. doing it on your computer, you're in a place where you can quickly type out a reply and get it sorted and you're in, yeah. often in work mode. But if you're checking it while you're supposed to be resting or eating or yeah. talking to your partner or playing with your kids or something, then yeah. all you're doing is absorbing the stress of what you've got to do, but without being able to do anything about it. Yeah. And we're much calmer and happier when we can attend to one task at a time and finish it and then move on to the next task and finish it and then move on to the next task. But what we're doing with all our devices and all our different tabs open, I mean, GPs have got like 10, 12 tabs open on an average day. If you're constantly shifting your attention backwards and forwards between them all, it's exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. So I would say if you need to get five things done in the day, do the first one finish it do the second one finish it do the third one much better than this kind of drop 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 between the five different things different whatever because your brain never really uh, focuses on the one thing and it never really switches off and has downtime yeah and as our good friend of the show dr gandalf from the egp learning podcast said he his one of his real um time hacks which i love is about batching so, you know, do batches of tasks together yeah. and emails are things yeah. that you can batch yeah. together rather than just spreading them throughout the day. So, so that's yeah. really yeah. helpful. You thing. might not want to do all of your letters, but batch it, do five of them and then move on to something else and come back and do another five. Yeah. Brilliant. So that's all about resting and setting boundaries. What, what else would you suggest is really important at the moment? I think staying connected is really important right now because we're disconnected, right? We're all kind of working virtually, working from home, we're in lockdown, we're not seeing people as much. I think we have to work really hard to try to still maintain that. And what I mean by connection is that those kind of interactions with people that you really enjoy spending time with, like the ones that make you laugh, the ones that make you feel like you again, the ones that you don't have to pretend to be anything else in front of, the ones that you know, you kind of come away from feeling uplifted and, and good about yourself. Yeah. So think about those people and make sure you're spending some time with them, even if it's online. Um, it's going to be a lot better than not. Because um, at times like this, when we get stressed, we tend to go narrow focus, blinkers on, get on with the job in hand. And we sort of cut off all that connection to the other people around us. And we're not designed to live like that. We're designed to be social animals. We need social interaction. Um, we need to be around other people. Um, to be well and happy and yeah so um I think yeah look after yourself your rest and your basics but also make sure you're connecting with other people around you so I was chatting with um some NHS managers recently and they said that when in the first lockdown the first wave they were very connected to their team it was all about how are you doing are you okay yeah. checking yeah. and well-being then once the acute crisis had gone and, and now it's all about, right, what are we doing? What's the process? And they're sort of forgetting to go back and do that. Yeah, yeah. And you don't have connection. to do a lot of it, again, for it to work really well. So it might just be one five minute check in a day. It might be you have one thing a week, but it, the point is that it's regular, it's there. You will keep each other in mind. And I think that's what we're struggling to do at the moment. We've got so much going through our minds that we're finding it hard to keep each other in mind and so if, again if we can put in place something that's going to do that without us having to think about it so you know that every Tuesday lunchtime at 12 for so 10 minutes you're going to get on that Zoom call and say hello that's going to help you yeah so I've been um, trying to have a little bit of silent time in my life I get very little silence for being a mum and a busy busy working mum and but what I've done I knew I wasn't going to do it by myself so I've just connected up with a few of my closest friends and we have a set time 15 minutes every week where we get onto a zoom call and we sit in silence together and it might sound really strange but it's absolutely lovely and I know if I didn't have that in my diary 
and the other people weren't going to be there, I probably wouldn't do it. I'd probably check my emails. So, yeah, finding ways that you can kind of help yourself to do these things that you know are going to help you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah really really important and i'll make a link available um document if you you're not quite sure how to run a five minute check-in chat with your team um mm. it, that we've got a little bit of a process that that might help if you want to click on the link to download that please do so um taking breaks making sure you've got boundaries and you're resting um connecting what else caroline anything else that could help well i think this time of year is a year that we're often thinking about um what new year's resolutions goals intentions things like that isn't it I think this is a time that we've kind of um whether it's instinctive within us I don't know but I think we've kind of trained ourselves to at this time of year to sort of take stock reflect and think about what we want going forward haven't we and I think a lot of people this year are struggling a bit with that because how on earth do you plan for what you want in the middle of a global pandemic second wave when you know it's a national lockdown you might be looking after kids all of this stuff's going on and I heard this lovely um example yesterday or the day before from somebody who shared that they they actually like to think about their plans and their intentions in January but they don't do them until the spring because they realise that for them, you know, the springtime is a time when traditionally things feel a little bit easier, it's a bit lighter, there's an energy around of new beginnings and, and nature and, and actually, so they spend January and February just gently, you know, musing over ideas and thinking about things, but not setting or trying to hold themselves to these new changes in behaviour. Um, until a time when actually it feels a bit easier and it got me thinking how lovely that is and actually whether that might not be a nicer way to approach these things for us particularly when something like this you know second wave of vaccination programs going on whether actually you could think start thinking about things now but maybe with a more gentle approach to what we might be able to do over the next few months rather than like I must do everything this week you know <laughs> I must get fit and I must do this and I must do that yeah. I think I think planning and and setting goals for yourself is is really vital now because a we need something to look forward to we really need a little bit of hope and you know things are going to be better and we're going to develop and stuff but but also because what I've noticed in in a lot of healthcare professionals and this is not just in the COVID crisis this is just in general is that often we we're a bit like it's just a, a piece of grass blowing in the in the wind just at everyone else's beck and call mm-hmm. just just going with whatever is happening and not actually saying, actually, this is what I want to do. This is the way I want to go and planning it for ourselves. Because the problem is if you don't plan and design your own life, then someone else will do it for you. And it probably won't be exactly what you want. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's really important that we give ourselves a bit of space and time to do that and to actually, yeah, like you say, get back in touch with what it is you want for your life, what you want to do, how, you know, And you might decide, well, this year, all I'm going to do is focus on my job and my commitment to helping the COVID, uh, to fight the COVID pandemic. And that's great. And how are you, but how are you going to do that? Mm. How are you going to look after yourself in doing that? You know, what's that going to look like for you? What needs to happen so that you can do that and feel good about it rather than feeling like it's something that, like you say, has been decided for you by someone else? Yeah. And And also asking, well, how, how am I going to know if I'm successful in that? Actually, what do I want the outcome to be? Because if I if I know that, right, okay, this year or this term, just till Easter, I want to focus on doing my job as well as I possibly can and making sure my team are okay. Yeah. That is my primary focus. It means that probably that thing I'm trying to do or that that other thing I'm trying to do, just just we park that and yeah. I'm going to get that to that. Yeah. And it, it gives yourself permission yeah. just to do that rather than trying to deal with every everything else I remember reading something about um there was a, a coach who, who used to set goals for his family right every every term I just thought to myself can you imagine if I sat down with my teenage and said right what are our family goals this you know but actually it was really helpful because he said that one of the kids had to get into they had to choose a new school and get them through exams and get them into this new school and so their family aim for that term was get a school yeah. and get them into the school and and everything else became and that was really helpful for me yeah. when I'm thinking about my family it's like okay actually this last term for Christmas I had to choose school and a sixth form for my well yeah. we had to choose school and a sixth form but I was like yeah. okay that's our goal for that term what's going to be our goal for this term and it's just really mm-hmm. helpful to go and everything else doesn't really matter but this is the main thing I'm focusing on I love that idea you shared with me the other day something that's stuck with me and I've used a lot which is the Stevens question idea <gasps> 
do you mind me sharing about it? But as I understood it from you, let me know if I've got this right. Yeah, yeah. Stevens was um, the coach for the Cambridge rowing team. And he came up with this idea that if we have one question that helps us to decide whether we should be doing something or not. And their question was, does it help them beat Oxford in the boat race? And so everything they were doing, it was like, OK, if it helps me beat Oxford, then we'll do it. If it doesn't, we won't do it. And this idea that you come up with one question that you can kind of judge everything against. And to do that, you sort of need to know what it is you want, don't you? You need to know what is your goal? What is your intention? So if you want to spend the next three months just giving it your all at your job at the moment and what you're doing and make no changes to that, then then what is the question that's going to help you to do that? You know, um, I love that you shared that the Olympic rowing team, the GB team used it at... Um, at the Olympics, um, and they, um, they their question was, does it make the boat go faster? Will this, for everything yeah. that we do, yeah. will this make our boat go faster? Yeah, and you said they didn't go to the opening ceremony because it wouldn't make the go- boat no, go faster. It probably make the boat go a bit slower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being tired and, yeah. you know, staying yeah. out and using some of their energy. Yeah. So I, I've I, actually used it a few times this week already with some doctors. Friends, yeah, they really? doctors to come up with their own Stevens questions. And, you know, so it might be something like... Um, is this going to help me feel more stressed or is this going to help me feel less stressed? Mm. You know, uh, yes. Great. Let's do it. <laughs> if it's yeah. not, then no, we're not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's... Again, it's thinking, what do you want? You know, make it conscious and, and then um, having ways to kind of keep yourself on track with that. Mm. Can be really helpful. And it's nice that if you, see, if you have that question, you know, is this going to be help, help me, look after my family and my friends or is this going to help me be a more generous person this year or is this going to help me just survive and I think sometimes yeah. just surviving is is okay yeah I don't think it's just surviving right now I think surviving right now is amazing it's an achievement right given what we're facing and what we're up against it's gonna yeah. help me survive without you know yeah. bending out yeah. and you can apply that question to all sorts of things yeah, you know absolutely. should I do this course is that going to help me survive should I eat that extra packet of biscuits yeah <laughs> But I think we can apply it to all all sorts of things, can't you, in in your life and everything that you do with your job, you know, should I take on the extra role? Should I do this? And um, and we've been particularly thinking about CPD and doctors recently, you know, and and you could apply that question to like Mm -hmm. any learning, you know, we've as doctors, you have to do 50 hours of CPD. I think that's pretty common, but every every specialty has to do 50 hours. Am I right? Certainly do in general practice. Yeah. About that, yeah. So, you know, am I going to learn this? Is it going to help me yes. survive the next three months? Or is it going to help me thrive in my job? Or if you want to be a trainer, is it going to help me be a trainer? Yeah. Is it going to help me teach better or look after my My, uh, my Stephen's question, Scruffy, is will it bring me joy? Oh, I love that one. And it really helps me. Helps yeah. me to just pick the things that will, yeah, keep me happy, healthy and bring me joy. Yeah, I love that. Actually, I've nicked that one from you. Yeah. Um, you know, will <laughs> it bring- take it. Anyone listening, please use it. It's great. I can highly recommend living a life alongside that question. Yeah, which, which doesn't mean to say you don't know. I was just thinking if I really applied that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, interestingly, you might have to let go of some stuff and it's quite hard to let go of, but it does. It really helps. I mean, we talk a bit, don't we, about essentialism. Was that book yes. written? Is it Greg? I can never remember who it is that wrote it. Greg McEwen wrote essentially. McEwen. It's, the strap line is do fewer things, but better. And yeah, honestly, so this idea of if you focus it, on lots of things, your attention gets and your energy gets spread. Whereas if you focus on one thing, lots, you know, you get, you go far. And, yeah. and I, I don't know, I think it, it's a little simplistic because obviously we do have lots of different roles in our lives, don't we? We don't just have yeah. one thing. Some of us are parents and doctors and lovers and whatever sisters and brothers and but actually that idea that actually if we just consciously choose to focus on fewer things we are going to be able to do those few things a bit give them a bit more of our energy and, and time so, yeah and it yeah. doesn't mean that you can't do other stuff it just means yeah. for this this season for this moment in time this is what I'm I'm, yeah. I'm focusing on and yeah. I think what, one of my very first podcast guests who's coming back soon so I'm really excited about Liz um Dr Liz O'Riordan who oh, is, love Liz. Yeah. she's fantastic isn't she right, she, yeah. she said that she would always say to trainees you know when you're asked to do a project by any consultant you you look you can you can have one maybe two projects on the go at once and mm-hmm. if someone comes to you and says right can you do this for me you say well I, I can but in three months time, unless yeah. you want me to drop one of these and you only ever have one or two things. On one in, one out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I like the idea of under scheduling. And this is absolutely alien to most doctors. And under scheduling. Me. Under scheduling. Yeah. Can you imagine? I know. <gasps> I'm still learning how to do it. But 
the idea that we would put in less into our time than we have time for I mean how extraordinary is that you know just the fact that that would be so alien to us I think says a lot you know those of us working in healthcare are more often than not over scheduling right yeah we're going 150 miles an hour we're fitting in eight ten hours work into eight hours day um and it's just exhausting and unsustainable so it's well it's normal isn't it it's normal to be overbooked your clinics are overbooked that's yeah. just what you do it's yeah. common it's certainly common i don't know it's it's just not healthy though is it and it's not enjoyable it doesn't bring me joy no. I think it does help in some respects. I've been thinking about this lately, actually, when the second wave hit and I had this desire to kind of do more. And I was like, oh, what's this about? You know, and I do think sometimes by doing we it helps us to deal with difficult situations because yeah. we feel like we're kind of we're helping. We're doing something about it. We feel like we've got some control in a situation where maybe we don't have much control. And I think sometimes it can be quite scary actually to stop and say, actually, if I don't do anything for two hours and a lot of us get this kind of anxious feeling of, oh no, but that makes me a bad person. I should be doing something. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you stay with that, it does ease, it does get better. And if we can give ourselves that permission to rest and do fun things and nice things and enjoyable things, even during difficult times, we actually become more efficient and are able to give more when we do give to others. yeah. Well, no, I, I, I completely get that. The thought of under scheduling. Uh, no, it's but I like it because hard. one of my phrases from from last year, and I'll talk about this another time. Is you know, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Mm. That was some advice that was given by some, some guru to someone, and, yeah. and I just think I've been really pondering that, and I just think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of course, when we're over scheduled, we rush. We're busy. We're late. We run late for things. We go straight from one thing to the next, and we try and get things done quickly. And and actually, we lose so much of the joy and the meaning in our life. You know. Yeah. Um. And those when we're out there busy, even helping patients who are dying from COVID, these are human beings. You know, who are separated from their families and their loved ones who need human companionship and connection and support and if we're dashing around stressed as all giddy up unable to even you know stop and take a breath and connect then yeah we miss I think we miss the bigger point of what we're all doing here and what's important and we fundamentally as doctors and as healthcare professionals and people working on the front line we're driven by meaning you know that's what makes our lives worthwhile you know we might think we want more money and more time and more help and da, da, da. but actually if we didn't have a meaningful job to do we'd be yeah life would be quite yeah quite empty and, and life is full of you know you know there's doctors there's lots of teachers that all started off in these really high high earning jobs that all left to, to do this other stuff that gives them yeah it really does give them meaning so it's so important it's yeah. really good and to we that. could do anything we could pretty much turn our hands to most things but we don't we stay doing these this these this work because it feeds our soul and our heart as much as our minds and our yeah brains yeah, yeah. so we're nearly out of time caroline but oh. are there a couple of quick strategies that people can use to try and you know just implement some of this st- stuff yeah, I mean, I go back to keeping it basic. So what do we need to do to stay alive? We need to breathe. So, <laughs> so breathe um, and, and breathe deliberately and slowly. You know, that can be so powerful. So if you're stressing out, if you if all you've got is 10 seconds, spend that 10 seconds breathing slowly. It will change your whole physiology, your whole way of thinking. It will, you know, things will feel more manageable. So I keep it simple, breathe, breathe. Um, what else? Stay connected don't do it on your own we're not meant to do this whole human life thing on our own we're not meant to go through these stressful times on our own lean on those around you talk to your friends talk to your colleagues stay connected thank you and then one of the things i would say is stay within your zone of power and Mm -hmm. this is something that we talk about a lot um your zone of power essentially is what you're in control of so Mm -hmm. A lot of us get very stressed and upset about things that are completely outside of our control, like what our patients are doing, their reactions to us, uh, the government policy, all those things. We, we, we can't do anything about that, but we can do things. We, we can change 
ourselves and, and what we're doing and what we decide to spend our time on, commit our attention to, the conversations that we have with people, all those sorts of things. So you really need to focus on what you have control of and, and, and change that rather than getting stressed about other things. I think that's a good place to start when you feel completely stuck mm-hmm. is just think, what do I have control of? What You can write down a whole list of things that are outside your control, but things actually, what could I do? What options do I have right now that are inside mm-hmm. my zone of power? And I think that's never been more important than, than at the moment, actually. Absolutely. I've been leaning on the serenity prayer lately. Yeah. Um, but as a recovering addict, I use it a lot. Um, but that idea of you know, grant me um, the serenity to accept what I cannot change, the courage to change what I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah. That's something I've uh, been leaning on a lot lately and I can highly recommend again. Really important, really important. So before we finish, just wanted to mention very quickly uh, something that Caroline and I are doing together. So it's very exciting, joint sort of venture together to try and help people actually take control of some of this stuff and and thrive in their in their work and their lives. Caroline, just want to tell us exactly what what that is. Yeah, so we um, we've set up some um, a series of webinars and a community for doctors to help them to learn to look, to look after themselves in in amongst all of this chaos. You know, I think last year when we we kind of met and started doing these webinars throughout the COVID, the first um, wave of the pandemic, uh, we got so much lovely feedback from people saying how helpful they were, and we really wanted to kind of put something out there that doctors could tap into to help them to to keep learning and to keep putting themselves at the you know as a focus of their learning and their, their growth going forwards and so yeah we've um we've come up with a series of webinars haven't we and we're calling it permission to thrive and it'll be launching soon um and it, yeah so i don't know if you want to say any more about that yeah so just every month you're going to get a webinar and a, a worksheet and a, a workbook to work through which is you know cpd that's joyful yes. <laughs> that will, yeah. will actually help you do your job better but also feel better and, and, and work happier. So if you're interested, do just click on the link in the show notes to find out a little bit more about that. And we'd love to have you join us in the membership if you want to. Yeah. Great. So Caroline, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a, a complete pleasure as usual. And uh, <laughs> we'll see you again very soon. Thanks, Rachel. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please share it with your friends and colleagues. Please subscribe to my You Are Not A Frog email list and subscribe to the podcast. And if you have enjoyed it, then please leave me a rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. So keep well, everyone. You're doing a great job. You got this.